Village of Wheeling special meeting is now called to order. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And before the clerk uh, takes the roll call, happy birthday, Clerk Simpson. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now take the roll call. <laughs> Thank you. We don't Trustee Hine. Happy birthday. Trustee here. Happy birthday. Trustee Vogel. Good. Happy birthday. Good guys. <laughs> Trustee Argyris. Mazel tov. <laughs> Trustee Brady. Happy birthday. Trusty Lang informed the board that he would not be here today he and President Abrascato. He said happy birthday too. Okay. And happy double birthday. Okay. Approval of the minutes of the workshop meeting of February 27th. So moved. Second. Motion made by Trustee Ajira, second by second. Trustee here. Roll call, please. Trustee Hine. Yes. Trustee here. Yes. Trustee Vogel. Abstain. Trustee Argyris. Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Abrascato? Yes. Mr. Fondilis, any changes to the agenda? No, Madam President. Thank you. Proclamation? Uh, National Safe Digging Month. Um, each year, the nation's underground utility infrastructure is jeopardized due to unintentional damage by those who fail to call 811 to have un underground utility lines located prior to digging potentially resulting in undesired consequences such as service interru interruption, harm to the environment, personal injury, and even death. In an effort to reduce these damages, the Common Ground Alliance and its 1,400 members promote the National Call Before You Dig number 811, which was designated by the Federal Communication Commission in 2005 to provide potential excavators and homeowners a simple number to reach their local one call center to request utility lines locations at the intended dig site. Through education of safe digging practices, excavators and homeowners can save, can save time and money keeping our nation safe and connected by making a simple call to 811 <coughs> in advance of any digging project by, wait, by waiting the required amount of time, by respecting the mark lines, by maintaining visual definition throughout the course of the excavation, and finally by digging with care around the marks. The Village of Wheeling agrees that safe digging is a shared responsibility. To know what's below, call 811 before you dig. Judy Abrascato, President of the Village of Wheeling, does hereby proclaim the month of April 2011 as National Safe Digging Month in Wheeling and encourage ex excavators and homeowners throughout Wheeling to always call 811 before digging because safe digging is no accident. Uh, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, April 2012. Sexual Assault Awareness Month is intended to draw attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and has public health implications for every community member of the Village of Wheeling. Rape, sexual assault, and sexual harassment impact our community as seen by statistics indicating that one in five women will have experienced sexual assault by the time they complete college. We must work together to educate our community about what can be done to prevent sexual assault and how to support survivors. Staff and volunteers of anti-violence programs at Northwest Center Against Sexual Assault encourage every person to speak out when witnessing acts of violence, however small. With leadership, dedication, and encouragement, there is compelling evidence that we can be successful in reducing sexual violence in the Village of Wheeling through prevention, education, increased awareness, and holding perpetrators who commit acts of violence responsible for their actions. The Village of Wheeling strongly supports the efforts of national, state, and local partners and of every citizen to actively engage in public and private efforts, including conversations about what sexual violence is, how to prevent it, how to help survivors connect with services, and how every segment of our society can work together to better address sexual violence. Village President Judy Abrascato joins anti-sexual violence advocates and supports service programs in the belief that all community members must be part of the solution to end sexual violence. Along with the United States government and state of Illinois, President Abrascato does hereby proclaim April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Thank you. Any appoint no appointments? 
And we do have an appointment, administration of uh, oaths, swearing in of our police officer, Rick R. Richardson. Clerk Simpson. Police officer in the village of Wheeling, in the village of Wheeling, in the counties of Cook and Lake, in the counties of Cook and Lake, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties, and that I will fa faithfully discharge the duties of the office of police officer, of the office of police officer, according to the best of my ability, according to the best of my ability. Rick, you want to step around front here? Before I present you with your new badge, I would like uh, some members of this audience to stand up. Our Board of Police and Fire Commissioners, if you can stand up. We have a five-member board, of which four are here tonight, including Bill Simpson, Al Palicki, Al Hem, and Mike Moran. These gentlemen uh, spend numerous hours going through countless interviews to come up with what we like to call the cream of the crop, which is here before us tonight. Officer Richardson, uh, and next Monday, April 2nd, will start a 12-week academy at the Suburban Law Enforcement Academy. And upon his graduation, he'll come back here and start a 14-week field training officer program. Officer Richardson, we, we hope you the best. We welcome you. And it's my honor to present you with star number 130. Introduce your family, including the Huttons. I'd like to introduce my, my father, Bob Richardson. <laughs> my mom, Jennifer. My sister, Rachel. My girlfriend, Jessica. <laughs> and my good friend and Northwestern police officer, Mike Hutton. And his father, Commander Hutton from Evanston Police Department. Nice. Well, we're glad to see that you chose to join our family. And uh, I also would like to thank the commissioners. Uh, without your help and expertise, we would not have what we have today uh, with our fine police department. And you would f you'll find as you work here, they're not only, you're not only a police officer, but you're a family. And everyone is here all of the trustees, all of the staff, but you have an excellent force to work with and we again thank you for choosing us. And with that being said, we always have to have coffee and cake, so we will uh, adjourn till uh, five minutes to seven. Do you have roll call? I do have a motion. So moved. Motion made by Trustee Adira, second by Trustee okay. Vogel. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we will adjourn and come back at five minutes to seven. Please join us for coffee and cake and welcome our new office.
need a motion. We need a motion to reconvene so at moved. 755. So move. Second. second. Motion made by Trustee here, second by Trustee Vogel. All in favor. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, number 12, old business is going to stay tabled. 13, new business, all listed items for discussion and possible action. Item 13A, discussion, presentation by United Way Metro Chicago and Live United 2020. Aha, there it is. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, I'm Marcia McMahon. I'm the Chief Professional Officer for the Northwest Suburban United Way, and that's the United Way that serves the area of Wheeling. And this is our president, uh, Jim Tanzer, who is our board president. Um, and want to say hello? <laughs> and, and actually, many may know that uh, my day job is I'm the Community Relations Director for NICOR Gas. <laughs> yes. Hmm. yes. <laughs> So thank you very much for having us here this evening. We wanted to come and talk to you a little bit about Live United 2020, which is our 10-year transformational vision for the community. Um, as you can see by the PowerPoint, we're actually providing a network of support across the metropolitan Chicago region. When we say United Way of Metropolitan Chicago, we mean all of the uh, territories that make up the metropolitan area. That's Chicago, the Northwest Suburban United Way, which serves 29 communities across the Northwest Scott suburbs in Skokie Valley, the North Shore United Way, which short serves the North Shore community, the South Southwest, which covers the South suburbs, and then DuPage and West Cook. So there are really five <laughs> small regions that make up the United Way of Metropolitan Chicago. And, you know, many of you I know are familiar with our historical United Way model. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the Community Chest, the Crusade of Mercy, and way, way back, the Red Feather. You can see all of the different symbols that used to uh, kind of identify United Way. Most familiar is that thermometer that we're in many, many uh, communities for a long time. And basically what we did as United Way in those days were to fund very small agencies, local agencies that served the community. Um, but our environment, as we've seen over the past few years, has really demanded change. We've seen corporations and individuals become more targeted in philanthropy. We've seen workplace giving um, decline year over year for the last two decades. Um, and as part of that, we move towards a greater operational efficiency by a consolidation of all our very small local United <coughs> Ways into the United Way of Metropolitan Chicago. We've seen a dramatic rise in poverty and need across all of our region, and now we focus on high-impact investments such as public funding for education, health and human services, and we've seen the decline in that funding, so we've really tried to step in at a certain point and make, make up the gap there. So really what we, what we really see to, what can we do actually in this environment to raise more dollars and to actually change our community? We've changed from a workplace fundraising organization which went out into the community and ran workplace campaigns to a social impact organization. And basically what that means is that we look at the issues of the community through many lenses, not just through the lenses of our agencies, but through the community, through government, through health and human services, through corporations, and through the actual people who actually live in these communities. And we actually focus on three key areas now for United Way, income, education, and health, because we really feel those are the building blocks of strong families and an independent life. Um, our, our transformation to impact is, has really been a three, it's been a process, it's been a three year process. In 2010, we looked at income, which is financial stability, and our objective was to increase the number of households earning, accessing, and managing an adequate income. And we actually um, focused on four areas. One was job placement, because workforce development is very key to making a healthy community. Um, financial literacy, once you get those people to work, we have to make sure that they understand how to manage their dollars. And then to build savings and assets, because that's very important. Um, and actually, while they're doing that and while they're looking for a job, we want to make sure they have access to all of the income supports that, that, that they are um, eligible for and that make them uh, live a good life. The next year, we focused in on health. And the objective was to reduce the increase of chronic disease and eliminate barriers to comprehensive health services. Um, and really looked at three different areas under health. 
We looked at access to primary comprehensive health care. We looked at prevention of chronic disease. And we looked at responding to crisis, because we know before we can concentrate on preventative health, we have to make sure that families in crisis are stable. Um, so we look at, in crisis, we look at the basic needs, food, clothing, freedom from violence, shelter, those very basic issues before you can actually attack health barriers and really get people on the road to self-sufficiency. This very past year, we focused in on education. And our objective here has been really in two areas. It's to prepare children to enter kindergarten ready to learn, and it's to make sure that middle school children enter high school prepared to go on with their high school career. Um, I know when I think back to my own children being in high school, that first semester of your high school career is so key. How you do at the end of that first semester really determines how you're going to graduate in four years. So if we can intervene at the middle school level and really work on those barriers that prevent children from succeeding in high school, we can ensure that more children at the end of the day will graduate. Um, in this, uh, this past year, we fund uh, for the Wheeling area, the Greater Wheeling Area Youth Outreach, which empowers young people from lower income families with opportunity, skills, and vision to achieve long-term dreams. And it really creates a system of supports for those middle school children and um, actually has readiness skills and mentors and tutors as part of the program to really make sure they're prepared for high school. Um, it's located three places at Holmes Middle School, it's located in Wheeling Park District, and it's located at the Greater Wheeling Area Youth Outreach Site in Arlington Heights. Um, and I guess our challenge for the community is this. If you think about if one family received all of these interventions for 10 years, if, they ha if their families had jobs, if they learned how to manage dollars, if they had access to comprehensive health care services, if when they were in crisis they received support, and if children had the interventions that made them able to learn in a timely manner, what, how would their lives be different? <coughs> and if you think of multiplying that by a thousand families in one area, if you could access these services over ten years, how would your community change? Um, so really, what we're really looking to do across our region over the next 10 years, eight years really now, by the year 2020, is we want to advance economic stability for 100,000 households. We want to make sure that 200,000 families and individuals are connected to health care. We want to make sure that 50,000 more underachieving middle school students are able to graduate from high school. Our metropolitan Chicago footprint, as I talked about earlier, really hits four areas. The North, um, which is the Northwest Suburban United Way and the North Shore. DuPage, which is, and West Cook, which is the DuPage West <laughs> Cook United Way. The South Southwest and Chicago. And we really target people living at 200% of the federal poverty level or less. And that would be $44,000 for a family of four. So if you can think about the challenges of having a family of four when you're making $44,000 a year and all of the things that they need for that family and for those children, you can imagine how challenging it is for people to live. So really what we're doing right now, which is really new for United Way, we are focusing in across our region at areas of greatest need and capacity. And we actually defined these factors in a, numbers of, a number of ways. We looked at children living in poverty and families living, living under that 200% of the family federal poverty level. We looked at medium income. We looked at education level and ISAT scores. And we looked at unemployment, because all of these kind of figure in to the need in a community. And capacity we defined as in existing investments that United Way has in the community right now existing best practice models that might have potential for expansion. So if there's a program going on right now that's really delivering good services, we want to look at that and see what giving some more dollars to that program might actually do for the community. We looked at the population and density, and we looked at school presence and success, the relationships we have with our educators. And across our entire region, we looked at um, different areas of interest. And this was the South Southwest, or this is the Chicago model, um, where they looked at three different areas. And I won't detail too much about that. DuPage and West Cook uh, actually are looking at three or four areas. But what's, what's more important for our area is where we're looking at in the Northwest Suburban United Way. And we're looking at actually four different areas. We're looking at the Carpentersville area to the west. 
Um, we're looking at Northeast Palatine and Rolling Meadows. We're looking at Skokie bundled up with Evanston. And we're also looking at what we call the Des Plaines River Corridor. And it really has nothing to do with the river or flooding. We wanted to anchor these communities that we're focusing in in some sort of geography for the northwest suburbs. So we look at a bundle of communities that really look at, at the north, Wheeling, Prospect Heights, Mount Prospect, Des Plaines, and a piece of Rosemont. And we're calling that the Des Plaines River Corridor. Um, so, you know, these communities are, are, this is the area that we're really concentrating all of our resources on for United Way. And then the south-southwest area. And why did we go to this strategy? Well, you know, as resources continued to decline over the past few years, especially at the state level, where uh, resources for our agencies serving the people in our community have really become scarce, we've needed to be really focused in on leveraging all of our resources to create impact. And targeted interventions in greatest need areas with strong capacity are the, most, are the most efficient way to really mobilize resources. And we need to look at the root causes of, an air, of our region's problems through a long-term systemic approach instead of just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. We really want to attack the problem at its cause. So we, we're talking about our 10-year vision being strong families and vibrant communities. And that's really what we want to accomplish here in, in, in Wheeling. Um, we're very excited about the, uh, the Greater Wheeling Area Youth Outreach Program. We're very excited about some of the other programs that we have going on in the community. And inside your packet, you'll see there is a listing of all of our funding and in income, education, and health that's across the Wheeling area. And you can take a look at this at, at your leisure. Um, but we really have invested over half a million dollars of our $1.8 million allocation budget right here in the Wheeling area, which we think is a very solid investment for this area. And what's really important to know that while we focus in on income, education, and health, we do not forget about crisis funding. Because as we talked about, we really need to stabilize families in crisis before we can move in to look at income, education, and health. And across our whole metropolitan region, we have al almost $10 million invested in crisis services. So really what we're doing is leveraging all of our United Way assets to transform our region. And that's funding, corporate partnerships, service providers, people just like you, um, village boards and trustees. And what we really want to do is make sure that you know that United Way is here in your community, that we serve people in need, and we really are committed to moving people out of poverty and onto an independent life. So in getting there, we've actually engaged, we're engaging residents, we're engaging leaders, we're look, we've done our education initiatives, we've made our early childhood grants, we're actually looking at how we can wrap then services and income and health around those families that are, and students that we're targeting for education. Because as you can imagine, a student, um, you have to serve the whole family to serve the student. For example, there was a student in one of our Greater Wheeling Area Youth Outreach programs who was not doing well in school. And we really did not, we really were trying to put a finger on why the student, particular student wasn't succeeding. And then came to find out that that student actually, and family, were actually homeless and they were living in a car. So you can imagine how hard it is to do your homework when you don't have a place, you don't have a home to do that homework in. So by looking at and actually wrapping all of those services around that student, we were able to find that family temporary shelter um, with a view towards getting that, you know, those, those parents back to work so they can support the children. And that's really the, the new focus of United Way, is like focusing on the whole family with comprehensive services. And then mobilizing, of course, our volunteer services and our, and our, um, with our board and with our community volunteers. So this is kind of the model that we're looking at. As you can see, um, we have what we call community schools and community centers. In the city of Chicago, many of our services are going to be centered in a school. In the suburbs, we're looking at a mix. There'll be some services centered in schools and some services centered in community centers. Um, the Greater Wheeling Area Youth Outreach Program, for example, has, is, is kind of a split of that. They have a program and services in the school, but they also have center where they provide services. We also fund for the area the Palatine Opportunity Center, which is a hub of services for the Palatine area. So looking at different programs like that is how we really want to 
uh, make sure that we can get services out to the community. The biggest issue we have in the northwest suburbs is transportation. So you can imagine by finding a hub like a community center or a community school, that's going to make it easier to deliver services. Um, we invite you to join with us to embrace Live United 2020. Uh, we want you to know that we're here in your community. We um, you know, appreciate your support in terms of talking about United Way and letting people know that United Way is here and United Way is at work. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Judy? Uh, do you have a question? Uh, just real, how does the community get involved? Uh, how do the dollars are? How do you raise the dollars and stuff like that? Well, we raise dollar, dollars primarily in, in, in several ways. Um, through workplace accounts, we go into businesses and we do United Way campaigns. We give everybody there the opportunity to give, whether it's through a check, a one-time donation, or a payroll deduction. Um, we do a letter writing campaign, and where people can, you know, send us a check in the mail. Or we also have volunteer opportunities. We're actually um, in the middle of looking at a brand new program that we're, we're, our Women's Leadership Council is going to fund. And it's actually a, um, an e-books tutoring program where you can um, uh, tutor and, and, and uh, mentor a child with a read, through a reading program. So there's volunteer you know, ways to get involved as well. And how do the cities get involved? Um, well, some of, the, some of the villages in the cities are actually putting together volunteer teams. Some are considering giving employees paid time off to, you know, during the work day to go out and volunteer at various sites. Well, those are some ways you can get involved. And you can also run an employee campaign in the village to support with dollars. But, you know, we really are looking at, at many things. Dollars are wonderful. Don't get me wrong. We can't operate our programs sure. without dollars. But we also need volunteer services. And I think that's almost as meaningful in some ways as get, writing a check. I think that'd be something we should probably look at. I mean, there's so much need out there today with mm -hmm. families in our own neighborhoods that we see that aren't there anymore. And you can only imagine how many are living in cars, like yeah. you said, right under our noses. So. Yeah. I think that'd be something that we should look into if we can. That's why we had the yeah. presentation so we great. can. Okay. Uh, let's get to that next step and see how we look can. Look what we're at. Absolutely. Our office is here to help you do that. Um, so, you know, we can get together. I see the thermometers in other towns all over their towns. I know. Which is a, a really a neat thing and it's a reminder to everybody in those communities that you guys are out there. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we've moved a little bit away from the thermometer sign because, you know, thermometers only measure money. And right. how do you measure success? And, and how do you measure volunteer hours? And how do you measure mobilizing the sure. resources of a community? So we kind of want people to know us, you know, that as a community convener, you know, not just a fundraiser. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 13B, discussion. Request for tax increment financing for 213-251 East Dundee Road. Mr. Vandapolis. <clears throat> Thank you. This item is a reintroduction of a TIF request submitted on behalf of Ted Mavrakis, who's the owner of the approximately acre of land uh, immediately west of the Fresh Farms uh, Shopping Center at Willie and Dundee Road, on the south side of Dundee Road. Um, the development group was before the board at the March 5th workshop meeting. Uh, to discuss the request, the board uh, did not um, uh, express an inclination to support the request, but had a number of questions and comments uh, regarding the application. <clears throat> Subsequent to that meeting, uh, we were able to meet with a development group who requested an opportunity to present to the board um, a, a broad overview of their general goals to prepare this site for future retail redevelopment and to uh, walk you through the planned improvements on a category by category basis. Um, the landowner, Mr. Mavrakis, is traveling this week, but um, Barry Melman from Horizon Realty Services, who's acting as the uh, broker and leasing agent, uh, as well as Mr. Goss, project architect, um, are here to offer you the, the project overview. Good evening. I'm Barry Melman from Horizon Realty Services. Uh, we're located at 1130 Lake Cook Road. Uh, we're the broker for this property, as well as about three other, actually, five other properties in the general area. So Wheeling and Buffalo Grove is kind of our, our headquarters, so I'm glad to be here to try to work with you on uh, perhaps correcting some misconceptions that occurred at our last uh, meeting, uh, last workshop, bless you, that occurred on March 5th. Uh, at the time, uh, we present, we discussed the fact that we're attempting to obtain TIF dollars 
for the redevelopment of this site, which is just west of the Fresh Farms property. As many of you probably know, this property was originally a residential property. Several years ago, an attempt was made to redevelop the property into a 10,000 square foot retail property. Of course, the economy and other factors precluded that property from being developed. Uh, Ted and Hans LLC, which is now the owner of the property, purchased this land and uh, with our help as brokers, we uh, were able to uh, begin the development of the property uh, on a smaller scale than the 10,000 square foot that was originally planned. However, still develop the whole property as a retail development. More important, we're very cognizant of the fact that with the new fresh farms and the developments that you've already initiated on Dundee and Milwaukee, that we're part of the gateway and we're committed to the village to create this property as uh, an improvement to the gateway and part of that redevelopment. The Dunkin' Donuts, as you know, was one portion of the property. It was the first portion, it's an anchor to the property, it's a way to attract additional retail to the property, and more importantly, the additional retail will help the Dunkin' Donuts in its uh, improvement in revenue as it goes on. Um, what we're hoping to achieve through these TIF dollars is to truly construct a pad-ready site that will attract additional commercial development and hopefully uh, through that increase sales tax revenue and property tax. Duncan is really just the first part of this pro project and we want to emphasize that these TIF dollars are not being provided to accommodate just the Dunkin Donuts. They are being provided so that we can take this property, which is, uh, you know, and, and I'm cognizant of this probably more than anybody having been a retail broker, it's not the prettiest site on the street. Uh, and we're aware of that. Uh, we're uh, trying to make this property much more in tune with the balance of what has been done with the Fresh Farm site. With me tonight is Ted Papyrus, who's the financial guy for uh, Ted Mavrakis, uh, and Greg Goss, who you've met before. We've kind of uh, put in front of you a chart which will indicate the various areas that we need funding for in order to obtain complete development of the site. So um, I think Greg's going to go through that colored chart with you that you have in front of you. There's basically seven items that we're looking for funding <coughs> for, and from those seven items we can achieve the, the total dollar amount that we're looking for in the TIF. So I'll let Greg, or Greg's going to do that first, and then uh, we'll be available for questions. I'm Greg Goss uh, from the Goss Group, the architects on this project for the last several years. <laughs> the, uh, the, the diagrams we prepared for you was trying to give you a good handle on what the TIF dollars was going to go for. And uh, as you can see, it basically concentrates on the perimeter of the property and through the whole block. And we work with staff, so we really were, are only requesting TIF-eligible items to be uh, requested on this proposal. Um, if we go back to the first slide, I'll run through the items uh, briefly. Come on, do that, or there we go. All right, the, uh, the first item was it's a sewer system. Um, now, there are several ways we could have accomplished this with our civil engineer. If it was just a, a first tenant approach, we could have gone out to Dundee Road and saved a couple hundred feet of sewer. Um, working with the staff, uh, we, we, the pink area down at the bottom of the site, uh, which is the, uh, 
the south end was sized for the complete development. This is an eight inch sewer line. All we really needed was a six inch sewer line, but for Wheeling to take possession of that sewer line, eight inches was uh, specified and was priced that way. With a manhole uh, ac accessing that, that couple hundred feet of sewer so that it could be easily maintained by Wheeling. Item two was a connection to the existing stormwater system. Again, this is not the area for the parking stormwater. We are only connecting across Wheeling Avenue from our storm sewer system uh, water control to the uh, stormwater sewer on Wheeling Road. <coughs> item three, item three was the um, the new sidewalks on Dundee and Wheeling. Now, this property does have sidewalks on all three sides of the property, but it's a carriage walk on Dundee to be consistent with the uh, fresh foods parcel and the wishes for Wheeling, uh, we're ripping out those sidewalk and curbs and putting in uh, uh, another sidewalk that aligns with the adjacent property. We're creating new uh, handicap access to the sidewalks. And again, as you can see in the, uh, in the green area that it's covering the whole frontage on Dundee Road and Wheeling Avenue. Um, item Four is actually on, on the next sheet is de demolishing the existing sidewalk and curbs and, uh, and getting it uh, land ready for the new proposal for uh, sidewalks. Um, item five are the access drives on Dundee and Wheeling. Now working with IDOT, these are the only two access points that we can use for the entire site. There won't be any more access, vehicle access to the site other than the right in, right out access on Dundee and the through access at the south end of Wheeling and the existing access on Wiley Avenue. Uh, so again, it's, it would be ready then just for the building to be plopped on into phase two and the vehicle circulation has already been worked out. Item six is um, basically the, the site was four or five residential units and so we're demolishing the existing water and sanitary sewers and abandoning that, that work. And so that would no longer be ex access to this site. Uh, item seven was uh, pursuant to uh, Wheeling's uh, code requirements or ordinance requirements. We're landscaping the parkway, all the frontages along Wheeling <coughs> and Dundee Road. So again, we're, we're expecting that the site would be uh, more presentable for future development when this whole uh, uh, long, uh, Dundee long block is, is ready for, uh, for the landscaping as the growth you know, period grows in with the trees and, and the shrubbery and, and whatever else there is. Um, we have thrown in some soft costs that uh, for you know, the engineering, the civil engineering, myself, and, uh, and the work that needs to be done for just these areas that we've clouded. And, uh, and that kind of adds up to the total amount of monies requested. The total civil engineering for the site is over $200,000. So the 122 is really only focused on improvements on outside of our property line and along the, uh, the public uh, areas of the site. Thank you. Did Trustee Vogel had a question, if he may. Uh, two, one for staff. Uh, it, it was mentioned in here that the anticipated sales tax revenue was going to be around 30000 Do we know what the anticipated increment for property taxes will be, moving it from residential to commercial? Best guess? It, that's not something we've looked at at this point. Uh, the the $30,000 figure they mentioned is based not just on sales tax, but also right. on food and beverage tax as well. Yeah. So um, that's something we can certainly look into, but I, I don't have that right now. Okay. Is there any guess? I, I don't yeah. know what the base EAV is for yes. that property, so I'd have to take a look at it. Okay. Well, we, is, we've is there budgeted, any? I'm sorry to interrupt you, we budgeted knowing that uh, what other retail properties taxes are in this area um, approximately six dollars a square foot uh, right now the property tax is at about two dollars a square foot now i can't say that that's going to be the exact amount but i can tell you that based on experience on both dundee and uh, willow road in wheeling uh, we do lexington commons we do 
uh, the property across the street where uh, the hair cuttery and Jimmy John's is, their, their property tax has gone up to $9 a square foot these days. So I would say that once this, as this property is developed, first in phase one and then going up through phase two, the property tax will increase uh, pretty substantially. Okay. The other question is, do you, without giving out any secrets, know what, uh, what else is going to possibly go on this site? And if you don't, uh, how do you know that these uh, expenses that you're laying out for sewer, sidewalks, curbs, cuts, and everything, uh, that you're not going to come back a year from now asking for additional TIF because now you got a new retailer in there that you didn't, you know, anticipate, and you're going to need additional money? It's a good question, and I, I can't answer, you know, fully right now because I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you this. Um, the, one of the reasons why we need to spend this money now is it's kind of the old story. You need to spend money to make money. If we don't do this now, I can't even begin to attract new retailers to the site. If I spend this money, I can tell you based on our experience in leasing in this area, usually about 50% uh, of the uh, retail component of a property such as this is going to be food related. We can go two ways. Uh, we have the potential here to build about 4,000 square feet more in retail. Our two ways to go would be one 4,000 square foot retailer if we can find one of those. Most likely it'll be two or three retailers uh, which are good because they generate more sales tax by having smaller spaces, they pay more property tax. So I would imagine that we'd have three to four 1,000 to 1,200 square foot retail units, not dissimilar to what we ended up doing across the street, uh, which means service type units perhaps, but uh, even the service units like the hair cuttery sell product that generates sales tax revenue. Uh, in addition, we're uh, probably going to have one more food retailer. We're talking to only right now, we're going out to our um, Las Vegas convention um, back in May, and we're already creating appointments uh, with some national retailers. Um, Peter, who works with us, is, is one of the best in the business. Uh, and I'm not just saying it because he's our friend, but he really knows this retail components. Uh, he's involved with all the retailers, and he's going to help us find the right retailers for these sites as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think, yeah. Do you have any other quick uh, Trustee uh, Brady. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I know I can't ask you for the timetable, because you don't know the timetable. This is going to depend on when you know, somebody comes in and, and, and is looking to, to lease the property. But what, what about the building that's there? You know, is that going to be torn down? Are you going to try to utilize it or what? Um, that depends on the potential tenants that we, that we get. Uh, we're looking at that um, for revenue at this point, uh, including, uh, to, uh, in including with the, um, the new building uh, to bring in the tenants that we want to have at some point. So, in other words, it'll stay with the exception of the new Dunkin' Donuts on the corner. The rest of the property is going to stay the same. So if somebody wanted to go in the middle piece of property, they, you know, with the old building next to them, might not be that enticing. Uh, and then if somebody does want the property for something, you know, are they going to wait for you to get rid of the, the tenants in your building, you know, which if they have leases, tear the building down, fill the sites, you know, as you think a tenant is going to wait that long? I don't think we're going to have any problems in, in asking the tenants that we currently have to go into a newer, a newer uh, facility for them. So I don't think that's going to be a problem at all. Uh, if, if, in fact, uh, you do get to get nod tonight, uh, we have to get into a, 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 an agreement, a development agreement with this. And I, I'd like to see some sort of a, a timetable that, you know, that, that this, is, this just won't go on for the next 10, 15 years as is. 
you know, uh, because we'll have spent this $120,000 for what? Mm -hmm. You know, to get a Dunkin' Donuts, which is a nice store, but it's not going to, on its yeah. own. Are you talking about a timetable for the construction of other buildings well, for, on for the site? For development of the entire site. Okay. You know. Sure. We usually put a schedule. So, I mean, I, in the agreements. I, I, I'm just a little concerned that until this economy shakes out, we have, we have a lot of properties sitting around waiting to be developed. You're, this is just one of many. And uh, I, what you have to offer uh, is a nice <clears throat> piece of property, right, as you said, in the gateway of the town uh, of, of Wheeling, but with no building sitting on the corner and, and, and the potential for having to wait to get that knocked down and everything else. I don't know if, you, if, 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 if somebody was really serious about building it, we didn't even wait for you. So I, don't, and I, don't, I know you don't want to tear it down and lose the revenue you're getting from there. So right. it could be a catch-22. Um, we don't want to diminish the importance of the Duncan and the fact that that does attract additional retail. Um, and yes, uh, none of us, again, have our fortune tellers and we can't really tell when and where it's going to happen. And, and the in retail environment hasn't improved, <laughs> you know, it's improved, but it, it's not this isn't 1989 so unfortunately we're we're still in a difficult economy but uh retailers are looking here and and wheeling is an attractive opportunity especially dundee road because uh, there isn't enough new development on dundee road right now and they're looking for that so uh you know is it going to be two years is it going to be three years uh, I can't really tell you, you know, I, I'm going to make it within that time. Um, it took us uh, a year to get the Duncan uh, fully approved on both sides of the table, your side and our side. Uh, so uh, how long it's going to take, I can't promise you, but I can promise you that phase two is on our books and we're going to start marketing it as soon as we can get all this other stuff done uh, how long does that take i usually tell retailers that you know our our owners it's going to take two to three years uh to really do it we're only talking four thousand square feet we're not talking ten thousand anymore so uh, it, that's probably a conservative estimate okay thank you Trustee Juris has a question. Thanks. I got a couple of questions here. If you're not able to get the nod to this evening, pretty much the deal's, what I understand, is dead with Dunkin' Donuts and you're not going to move forward. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, you know, just to kind of piggyback on the reverse side with Trustee Brady, too bad we didn't have timetables on stuff that we bought on South Milwaukee Avenue that took eight years for us to get the shovel ready like we did today. You know, you said it earlier, you got a piece of property there, what you want to call it a gateway, I don't know if so much about that, but it is a hodgepodge today. Nothing's connected, it's commercial over there, and it needs to get ready there. And to put a time restraint on somebody to say, you know, in three years you're going to turn around and knock down the building and do something else with your phase two and move forward, to me that's unfair. Because what are you going to do? Ask them for the $122,000 back? That we got this property with the infrastructure that needs to be in place that hasn't been in place? I mean... We finally got somebody in here that didn't give us a song and dance. They actually are building a building there that are leasing it to Dun uh, the Dunkin' Donuts and are looking to improve that site tremendously because it's terrible right now. Your carriage walks, everything's a mess over there. So you're now going to have something that's going to look nice and why not? And I agree with staff. You know, and Tony, I'm going to piggyback with you a little bit here. You got five, you got so much different utility there. It's all separate, isn't it? It's, it's not cohesive with the entire site there. So if these guys don't do the work there, you're never going to see anything done there anytime soon. Am I right? Because <clears throat> there was homes there, and each home had its own separate line, and it fed into each other, right? And remember what the homes looked like, guys. Let's be honest. That was pretty. Yeah, I believe there's four or five services on the north side, and they are in the pavement area, Dundee, uh, sewer and water would have to be abandoned on the north side. So there's about five holes they got to drop. Permits, land closures, it's, it's an expensive proposition. And on the south end there with the new manhole and all that, how do you service that area there now if you needed to? <coughs> how are you servicing that area if you had to go in there? 
For sanitary? Yeah. Well, if it was just one structure, they would go probably, like uh, he said earlier, they would probably just run a new service line across the street uh, on Dundee there. Road. But if they're going to put four buildings, three units, four units up, then they would put uh, a main line through the rear, which is what they're proposing. Which they're proposing now. But today, <laughs> with, the, with the building there at the east end, how are you serving? Is it difficult to service that area? It's not up to village standard, is it? And the sanitary there now? I'm not sure where that service line comes from. I believe it goes across the street to, to uh, yeah. on Willie. To me, I think we have an opportunity. These guys, you know, they were fortunate enough to, to purchase the property from the previous owners. And, you know, it was a foreclosure. It's public record. And moving forward aggressively to try to get something nice over there. And I think, you know what, it behooves us to do that. And you know what, TIFs are for... They're eligible, and staff has gone through these things, and Peter, thank you for that, and, and Michael, because their list that was existing about $150,000. You, you, you cut it down a little bit. They understand it, and they're doing a lot of stuff that I think is going to beautify that corridor there, and why not? So, And you have a revenue source from the get-go that you're going to recapture some of the dollars that's not TIF-related, which is our sales tax and our food and beverage tax and our user tax that stays in the general fund and doesn't have to be split amongst the rest of the taxing bodies. So I think this is a great opportunity to finally, hopefully one day soon, get rid of that <laughs> office building there with that terrible signage over there, because it looks bad. It really does. So, you know, I needed to make that comment, and I thank staff again, because you brought back a, a package that makes sense, and you guys did your homework on this, this and, and you're in favor of, hey, let's get this infrastructure in here and make it cohesive with everything else around there. So I thank you guys for that. Thank you. Trustee Hine. Thank you. Um, I guess Fresh Farms is uh, setting the benchmark a little higher for that area. And one of the things that I always believe in, that we say that TIF is to be used in blighted areas. And if you want to qualify your piece blighted. of property as a blighted area, um, uh, so be it. But when I look at a TIF area, I look at a total development. And there were four other buildings on that piece of property, be it they being single family homes from back in the 30s and the 40s and so on and so forth. But it was always considered to be retail and commercial on that property. Uh, they were there for an awful long time. But as long as I can remember, that piece of property was always designated to be a commercial piece of property. Granted, there are some drawbacks to that piece of property because of the fact that you've got some service lines. You don't have sewer lines going, four big sewer lines going to each one of those houses. You have small service lines that were used to service single family homes in those days. So it's a cleanup, just like any other site in the village of Wheeling. Okay? And as far as you hooking into the sewers that are belong to the village of Wheeling, the transmission sewers and water, okay, uh, I think they're, a, they're adequate enough now, or maybe with a little uh, fixing up here and there, they would be more than adequate to take the type of buildings you're going to be putting on this piece of property. The biggest drawback I can see to this whole thing is, number one, when Dunkin' Donut came before this board and the Planning Commission, they got their approval for that site. They then started to negotiate their lease with the owners of that property. Evidently, something has changed in the structure of that lease because now, all of a sudden, you folks are coming back saying that you need some TIF money to help out in this situation. Granted, that's what TIF money is for. However, if you're going to look at the total picture, the building to the east, the last building you have there, that office building, and the building behind it, definitely fits the category of blight. And it should come down. If we can help you with that, I'd be, mo I'd be one of the first ones to step up to the plate and say, yeah, you got yourself a, a good going program here. But we're talking about Again, subsidizing a strip center. 
you folks have been there now for a couple of years with an empty lot. And we've got a few empty lots in Wheeling. And we're struggling in this economy to take care of those lots. I would like to know an answer from you right now on who and when and how are you going to fill those extra spaces that are going to be left there if we go along with this program. As we said, there's we don't have a, um, a five people standing in line uh, uh, to, uh, to to occupy the space there currently, uh, but we're we're asking not to. I mean, all the things that we've put into this proposal um, is is basically things that are going to be necessary for the building. Whether or not we knock it down. Uh, the, the current building that's there, it's still going to need the sewer system, it's still going to need the sidewalks, it's still going to need um, uh, everything else that needs to, to that, uh, that we're, we're putting there. We're uh, putting the, um, the landscaping to make it more attractive. Um, so it's not, we're not, we're not saying we're going to put a building up just so that in two years from now, when, if we see something or whatever, uh, that doesn't appeal to us that will knock it down and that was some of the money that that the village was willing to give us We're not asking for that. We're just asking for infrastructures things that that um, Typically you would expect someone to put in the, you know the village to be putting in the sidewalk to be putting in the sewer systems and so forth and so we're not We're not we're not saying you know, we'd like an extra uh, an extra dollar to do anything else if you were to be a resident of the village, a commercial resident of the village of Wheeling right now, and you were to have a problem with your service line and con you contacted the village of Wheeling, the answer would be to you that it's your service line and you're responsible for it. What you're asking us to do is to take that site and to, to clean it up for you. And at this particular time, I don't see the benefit of giving any TIF money in that area. Because number one, okay, uh, Fresh Farms is a total success over and beyond every, what everybody expected. And we inherited some problems with this gr great thing that happened that had to be worked through. One of the things that I look at over there is that that is an access between two roads to the residential area over there that being Wheeling Avenue and Willie. Right now, if you're going eastbound on Dundee Road, okay, I can see traffic start, with, with your development and Fresh Farms, it's starting to block up. I live in the area. There's gotta be some way that we put right turn lanes on Dundee Road so that we can stack them up in the right lane rather than having in the, in the, in the through lane because now people are starting to, starting to go back and forth, back and forth. The question I have is, do we have the 17-foot right-of-way that we've always wanted on Dundee Road so that we do have access to a right turn lane from Wheeling Avenue beyond Willie to Milwaukee Avenue so that everybody is in a right turn lane? Not only for the convenience of people using the center, but for emergency vehicles and such because we now have a new fire station down on Milwaukee Avenue. So we've got all these things to look at, okay? And that's what I look at when I say, how can I get the best use for the TIF money that we're giving out? And granted, we're not talking about a lot of money here, okay? Some of the TIFs that we've done have been pretty, pretty high. But it's the practicability of, of what we're going to get for the dollar that we're spending. And right now, I don't feel that with this economy that we are really spending our money the right way. Because I think we're trying to recover from a catch-22 that Dunkin' Donut threw at you guys when they didn't have a lease signed up and they already got their zoning for it. Thank you. Trustee Brady. <clears throat> I just kind of add, you know, I think this is a great spot for Dunkin' Donuts. I think Dunkin' Donuts going in here would be a good thing I, I am concerned about balance of the property. You know, we, we own sites all over the place. Uh, one down at Jeffrey and Milwaukee Avenue has been sitting there how many years now, prime piece of property, begging for a restaurant or something of this sort, and, and, and we can't get anybody to land on it. You know, and, I, and I'm afraid that's what happened here. And, and what will happen is the building will stay up and you'll squeeze some sort of business in between the Dunkin' Donuts and that building 
and that'll be it. That building will never come down, maybe not even ever get remodeled. And and we spent money to improve, you know, the site and improve uh, uh, our, our our main street. Uh, and all I want is through, I, I would be agreeable personally to vote yes tonight and just have the attorney work out with the redevelopment agreement some sort of terms that that might put a little bit of pressure on you guys to get this job done the right way and as quickly as possible. Trust me, where the money that were, the, the the my boss uh, does not um, spend money thinking that you know I'm gonna. 20 years from now, I'm going to see a penny return. Uh, I mean, we're businessmen just like everyone else is. So we're, if we find someone tomorrow that's willing to take a portion of it or three quarters of it or, or what have you, uh, we'd be on it immediately. Well, I mean, I, it's, so. First of all, i got to congratulate you on your honesty because I think you're the first developer that came in here and didn't have this glorious list of all the people that he's got lined up for the piece of property. You're honest. You know, and that, that's a good sign because, I, you know, you, get, you, you hear it time after time after time and nothing ever comes of it. So, uh, you know, in that respect, I, 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 I know you guys, you know, the owner isn't going to sit on this thing. I know that. But, but here we are with a piece of property that, that could be a gold mine to the right. And, and we, we can't, I mean, everybody looks at it and, and the price is right, but no, nobody's buying it. You know. We have some good people that have, that have helped us with other projects that we've put together. And... Uh, uh, I'm not going to say that every single one of them was a fantastic success story, uh, but we've done a good job. Good. Well, let's see if you can do one here. Thank you. So our question is, consensus is if uh, we want to uh, go ahead and uh, do the tax increment and then get a... Uh, an agreement signed and taken care of. Does somebody else have a question? Not at all. Mm -hmm. Let's go first. Doesn't matter. No. Okay. So our consensus is Trustee Ajiris? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. <coughs> Trustee Brady? Yes. Trustee Here? Yes. Trustee Hine? Question. What are we taking the vote for? To give the go-ahead to go ahead and start to uh, no. the request for the tax no. income. And myself, yes. So we have that uh, five, yeses uh, five yeses and one no and one absent. So we'll work with the attorney. The attorney, we need to work with that and the, the gentleman and then come back to us with, after we start to get that. We will do okay. that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gentlemen. We appreciate the vote of confidence. Thank you. Item 13C, discussion regarding presentation by the Streetscape Subcommittee of the Plan Commission. Manager Fondulis. Uh, thank you, Madam President. In fact, I'm going to introduce uh, our Subcommittee of the Plan Commission um, at the August meeting uh, from 2011, which was a joint meeting between the Plan Commission and the Village Board. <laughs> there was desire for a subcommittee for uh, Streetscape to be formed and report back to the board on a number of topics uh, that will be covered this evening. Um, I believe Commissioner Stylin is going to lead the conversation, uh, but we'll have some involvement from the entire committee. And uh, this is just a review of some of the work that the subcommittee has done. At the end of the presentation, uh, Andrew Jennings will explain a little bit of the next steps and we can go from there. So, Commissioner Stylin, if you would, please. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam President, trustees. Um, as uh, John said, on August 8th, there was a joint meeting of the Village Board, the Plan Commission, and Village staff. And in that meeting, the following objectives uh, were discussed. First, how the Village Board and the Plan Commission can work together to bring development to Wheeling and to expedite the groundwork for updating the associated plans and village codes. <clears throat> and second, to develop a team approach to get us all on the same page and working in a common direction. 
To that end, two plan commission teams were created, one researching streetscape and the other researching the Southeast TIF district. We are here tonight uh, representing the efforts of that uh, streetscape team. The street states is going to be a tough one. The, the streetscape concept was divided into three topic areas. Streetscape landscaping and design by uh, PM Dorband and consultant uh, Ken Brady. Street lighting by Norm Schaff and uh, consultant uh, Matt Deutsch. And side, sidewalks by myself. And lots of other individuals that offered comments and suggestions along the way. We met eight times and had many additional at-home research hours. A detailed presentation of our findings and recommendations was made to the Planning Commission on February 16th at their regular meeting. Their recommendation was to cut the presentation down to 15 or 20 minutes and to proceed to the Village Board. A copy of the uh, detailed uh, presentation that was over 40 slides uh, is in the uh, handout material on tab number two. Common to all of the team efforts was the objective of dividing the research into three finer areas. Arterial being the heavily trafficked uh, streets, collector those interconnecting streets, and local and residential and industrial streets. Each of these district areas, as we called them, could have a potentially different design and plan. And we'll show you some examples as we go on. We spent a lot of time on these areas. Some were covered more heavily than others. Some, unfortunately, due to the lack of time, were barely covered. Per your direction, we had minimal involvement with staff. We gathered a lot of information over the three months and have put it all in our handout. And we hope that it will be of value to the next team that continues the work on these topics. And maybe we have planted some seed concepts that will continue to grow in the future. This is a book that's representative of our handout. And I think John has made a PDF of that uh, uh, book, if you will, available to uh, all you. Uh, Pam will now summarize some of the efforts, efforts of the uh, street, streetscape team. I'm not going to get that right. It's going to be a tongue twister. Well, this was our team effort, which is part of, and you can read that, and I won't go on for that. Um, the Bike Safety Town was initial uh, investigated quite some time ago, many years ago in fact, and was resurrected under the streetscape heading. However, the information that's in your packet is already outdated. At a meeting attended by Ken Brady, Jan Bukes from the Park District, as well as a meeting with Chief Benson, Deputy Chief Tevens, Officer John, Abio and Sergeant Paul Hart and myself proved that the initial project would be cost prohibitive. Uh, this project here is a minimum of $1.5 million, which we were not aware of. However, last Thursday, Ken Brady and I met with Jan Bukes, Police Commander Panagakis, Chief Benson, Deputy Chief Tevens, and Village Manager John uh, Sandillas to discuss an alternate possibility of implementing a program to educate children on bike safety. At that meeting, it was determined that there may be a need for this type of program. However, it could possibly be held in various areas around the village. The bike safety rodeo, which has been done in the past, will be offered again and is anticipated for June 16th from 10 to 1. The location is still to be determined. The initial push will be initiated by the police department, but if it, the initiative proves successful, the bike there will be, or hopefully will be, a bike safety board uh, to lessen the need for police officer involvement. 
We would like to extend our sincere appreciation to everyone who attended these meetings to help us reach what we believe is a wonderful alternative for bike safety for children. Volunteers will be needed for the June 16th rodeo and for all future activities. In addition to teaching rules of the road, the police department will hold instruction on helmet fitting, bike seat adjustment, and safety checks for bike brakes. The bike, if I may. Yes. The bike safety is just for children, not for adults. Well, we haven't figured out how to do that, although that was part of our uh, conversation with the police chief, but we haven't figured out how to do that. We're going to try this first, and but it, that's a good suggestion. I'd like to see the adults <laughs> need I that. Would, I would, too. <laughs> They're worse than the kids. Uh, mm -hmm. My next piece is the yeah. streetscape, signscape, and median scape. The bulk of the information collected in your packet within the PowerPoint and in the summary report, <coughs> it was collected by a one-time discussion with Lori Hazelwood, our supervisor for forestry, who was extremely helpful and very knowledgeable. Um, please note the uh, percentages listed on each of the recommendations. There's only one here as an example. Um, as well as the extensive list of resources that was provided by Lori. We would like to suggest that the village pursue the creation of a more comprehensive streetscape, signscape, medianscape brochure handout. While our current applications include guidance, we may need to update or enhance some of the materials. This upgrade to our existing landscape application and guidelines will help everyone to better understand the potential changes we, as a village, would like to see in our village. While this may take some staff input and time to create, it is our belief that once created, will be a time-saving for the future as the framework will be in place. Now I would like to turn over the next portion of this to Norm, who will report on lighting. Thank you, Pam. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, thank Matt Deutsch for his help and uh, guidance uh, in this part of the project. Uh, the first slide, um, which is uh, in the summary under tab 15, uh, shows the existing standards which are discussed in the methods of practice for the design and public of public and private improvements, chapter 8 under the Division of Engineering. The purpose of the manual is to present consistent parameters for the design of public and private improvements. The drawings are located in the standard details. Uh, those are the, the two uh, black and white drawings uh, on the left of that. The second part of this slide, the color photos, are examples of street lights on Milwaukee Avenue, the second from the right photo. Uh, the one with the wreath on there, and the other communities, Huntley on the far right, uh, showing different styles of equipment that are available. Researching street light equipment, we found a vast variety exists. Our conclusion is the choice of equipment depends on the personal preference of the designer and the economic value of that equipment. <clears throat> Next, we look at the criteria, also summarized. Uh, in the summary under tab 15. We believe that the choice of equipment should be made uh, using the following criteria. Select a basic light pole structure for each special district area, arterial, collector, and local. Equipment should have a decorative base option, a decorative pedestrian lighting option, banner option, flower basket option, a light head that is upgradable for future technology. We believe the most important point is the light head should be upgradable for future technology. 
the latest technology being used, light emitting diode LEDs, is a semiconductor light source. LEDs were introduced as a practical um, electronic component uh, in 1962. LEDs have a high initial cost but possess a long life and low maintenance. The village has completed replacing 249 of its existing street light fixtures with LED fixtures in the Hollywood Ridge, Poplar Grove, Dunhurst, Old Town, Meadowbrook residential neighborhoods. That cost was provided by a federal grant. We've worked up some uh, uh, recommended priorities. Elmhurst Road between Dundee and Hintz. It's a candidate for uh, a median uh, with landscape islands and lighting down the center of the street. Uh, the next one would be Elmhurst Road between Dundee and Lake Cook Road. Uh, it should have a high priority with the park, many multifamily residences, and the new daycare center under construction. Uh, next on the list, Lake Cook Road between Buffalo Grove and the train tracks, and that should be coordinated with the widening of Lake Cook Road now being planned. Uh, we have Dundee Road between Buffalo Grove and the train tracks, extend the street lights already in place on the west end using the same or similar lighting style. Schoenbeck Road between Hintz and Dundee should be another high priority because of the library, the park, schools, residential area. More locations could be identified and prioritized. This could help in obtain, obtaining available grants or funding. And now I'd like to turn over the remaining items of the presentation back to Terry. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Norm. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, sidewalk efforts. The team recommendation for sidewalk design is for uh, arterial streets, you know, the, the big street sidewalks to be 8 to 10 feet wide collector streets to be eight foot in width, and local uh, streets to be uh, five feet, and to avoid any car bumper or vegetation overhang uh, into those areas. Now, as a consultant has been hired to work on the bicycle and pedestrian path concepts, and the fact that the village is currently in the process of videotaping the curbs and the uh, sidewalks with their video camera concept, we decided to defer further discussion on prioritization until those results were available, but we do have some recommendations. One point is clear, the room for sidewalk creation is very limited, and with every street widening, it gets even more limited. We need a new standardized plan for sidewalks in these limiting areas. Should we have a curb to storefront as in many urban areas? Should we have sidewalks with tree, gr tree grates? Should the grates be near the curb or further away? If we have room for a grassy parkway, should the grass area be near the curb or should the sidewalk be adjacent to the curb? Let's take time now to discuss these issues. We need a consistent approach in the future. Now, village ordinances currently state that every property should have a sidewalk, but the ordinances are not clear on when or how. For major site plan changes, petitioners can install a sidewalk or make a contribution to the sidewalk fund. Fund. Today, it's their choice. But if it's not installed today, it will cost the village much more to do it next year or five years from now. Additionally, does it make sense to install a sidewalk that goes nowhere? And you've heard plenty of petitioners talk about that issue. 
in the far interior of an industrial area? Or would it be better to take that money and install a sidewalk at the entrance to the, to the industrial area where many more people could take advantage of it? But is that legal? Can a sidewalk impact fee, for example, be imposed? And what is the exact different differentiation between a major and a minor site plan change? These definitions need to be firmed up and be, much, be made much clearer to everyone. Now, Warrenville, Illinois, has developed an approach to determine their sidewalk need. Basically, they map the, the, and prioritize the high traffic areas around public buildings, stores, schools, uh, bus stops, and other areas. And then the ter determine the concentration of these entities within a given area. Their exact scheme is included in the handout materials under tab 27, but it would be a natural for our GIS system with the assistance of public works and community development, we might have a system that's capable of telling us exactly where the need is to install the next sidewalk uh, segment. Now, here's an example. Our, all of the sidewalks in the village today are mapped into our GIS system. I've overlaid some of the pedestrian-oriented uh, points, shopping, library, parks, pace bus stops, etc., uh, and drew a two-tenths of a mile circle around each point. The more overlap of each circle, the greater the need. Using a system like this would tell us exactly where sidewalks are needed and its priority. It may even give us the uh, basis for shovel-ready plans that may help us get some additional uh, external funding for uh, the construction of uh, the projects. Okay, I'm going to take off my sidewalk hat and go back and speak uh, for the entire team. Our streetscape subcommittee recommendations are to expand the subcommittee or the concept to include more PC, trustee, and staff members. The three of us can't do this alone. We need more help. We need to continue the research and pursue the arterial collector and local design standards for streetscape, lighting, and sidewalk to topics. We think this is a good methodology to use, and it only generates nine areas that need to be covered in a little more detail. We need to create and update village documentation on these areas. We've discovered some areas where additional documentation may help petitioners, plan commissioner, commissioners, and staff work better together. We need to integrate the existing standards into the village documentation. For example, we couldn't find the Milwaukee Avenue streetlight <coughs> design documentation. It must exist somewhere, but uh, again, with out seeking a lot of staff support. We, we couldn't find it. We need to integrate the uh, bike and pedestrian plan, the sidewalk and, and curb uh, videotaping, and the GIS uh, sidewalk data into our planning efforts. We need to pursue the viability of uh, the bicycle uh, safety town concept and look for forming a bicycle safety board of directors, as Pam talked about. Again, we need some additional help. We'd like to affirm a plan and criteria for the installation of new sidewalks. We'd like to be able to create shovel-ready plans that might attract additional funding. And we, we really request the Forester's time to review the PC docket landscaping plans. Lori did an excellent job of suggesting some changes to our landscaping concepts. And if we can just get her to comment on some of the petitioner's docket items as they flow through us, we think it would be of an immense value. We'd like to improve the visibility of Title 1204, which is the landscaping maintenance requirements for anybody in town that has 
uh, landscaping, it's hard to find, we can put that into our application materials and into some of our PC docket uh, items. We'd like to create a long range plan for that grassy meeting, uh, median and lighting on Route 83. Uh, it's one of the few town areas that we could accomplish this, and it might save on some of those uh, street lighting costs by putting the street lighting down the center of the street as opposed to having duplicate uh, poles on each side. As Norm said, we need to create a long-range plan for lighting on Dundee Road and start thinking about the lighting, landscaping, and sidewalks on arterial streets, and maybe Wolf Road might be a good example in a starting point. Now, many of the items uh, that we've talked about are moving into the Plan Commission's discussion list, but there's still a lot to be done. Who should do it, when it should be done, is really up to you. We understand that the time might be right for a streetscape implementation as the result of Horizon Park. If we get started now, we might have a, a plan ready by the time the county is ready to start their planning efforts. And finally, for the big picture. Here we are just at the board direction phase of the flowchart. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. This is not a complete proposal, but just a status report on the current status and a few recommendations. We've included all of our research material on a CD and in handout form, and hopefully these will be of benefit to others. Today, we are asking if and how you want to continue but we don't expect your answer today. I'd like to thank Pam and Norm for their coordination efforts and all the other individuals who provided input into this project effort. It was fun, and I think it brought our team a lot closer together. <clears throat> I'd like to turn the uh, presentation and our handout over to uh, Andrew Jennings, uh, our village planner, who can uh, discuss uh, how the ideas and concepts might continue to flow through the process. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Jennings? Thank you. Uh, the, the purpose of this slide uh, is to sort of illustrate uh, for the board how the, the broad range of topics discussed by the, the Streetscape subcommittee uh, could affect the uh, policies, the planning documents, uh, the various parts of the municipal code. And as we take, uh, take the document that's being presented by this, uh, the subcommittee and really get into it, uh, this just illustrates how the, uh, the topics are spread throughout a variety of, uh, of places uh, that the staff is going to need to take a look at. And, um, uh, with that, I'd like to just pass it on to uh, Village Manager Spondilis. Mr. Uh, thank you. The, the obvious question, and, and as Commissioner Steinland said, is what are the next steps? Um, this is a very, as Andrew said, a very broad uh, discussion. And the book that was referenced earlier, I do have in PDF form, and I can forward to the board, uh, and we'll do that. Uh, but what the staff is going to do, and as has been stated, the staff was not really involved in the creation of that book. So there is a lot of discussion that needs to be had on each of the three categories, and I'm glad that, that it was split into those three categories to identify really the focus of, of what the subcommittee was, was looking at. So what staff is going to do is take those three areas, the, the streetscape, landscape, and design, street lighting, and sidewalk topics, go through the research material that the subcommittee has put together and come back to the board, which is illustrated on the, the slide in front of you, because one of three things can happen if we're going to move forward with a plan in any of those categories. Either we will adopt uh, the idea into the comp plan, we will incorporate it into the long range financial planning of the CIP, or we will affect, somehow we'll codify the idea as part of our code. So it's either policy or code, CIP, or our comprehensive plan. So staff is going to, to break off and take each, a look at each one of those three categories and come back to the board with recommendations as necessary. 
We thank you. We thank you for all of your your time and your effort. Uh, it's a long-range plan, and it will be taken a look at. And as uh, Mr. Fondila said, we will see where that will fit in. And you've done an excellent job. And we, on behalf of the board, I thank you myself personally because I know how much work you put into it. Thank you. Now we have official communications. A lot of work. And this evening, uh, Golden Apple uh, showered students with $23,000 in financial uh, aid over the next four years. And as you look at it, it was in the Daily Herald. Uh, there were, uh, in the northwest <coughs> suburbs, students selected from among 1,285 nominees. And of all those students, we had two, not just one, but two from Wheeling High School, Michelle Issen and also ben uh, Benjamin Reef. So there again, it is just an accomplishment, if you would, of how great our school district is, how great our children are, and how we all work together. So I congratulate the Apple Scholars, because that's a $23,000 scholarship over the next four years. So uh, hopefully if you know the persons, make sure that you tell them congratulations. I know that I spoke with the uh, principal on uh, Friday, and we talked about some of the other accomplishments with the STEM program. So for anyone that is listening, Wheeling High School parents or students, uh, we congratulate and I thank you and I thank you Trustee Hine. He brought me the copy of this and I appreciate that we, we all work together as a team and therefore we can get this information out. Yes, Trustee Adiris. Thanks. Just a couple of quick things. To, again, thanks to the Planning Commission and the team for bringing the spirit of the Planning Commission back. Because you know what else? I'm, I think that's what happened 14, 15 years ago. We came out as plant commissioners and thought out of the box to try to betterment the community, whether it be the comp plan, whether it be the town, town center, stuff like that. And kudos to you guys. Just one quick question. Did staff help you with this PowerPoint? Who did this PowerPoint presentation? You did, Mr. Sam? Yeah. And that book? Hmm. Without staff. Interesting. Thank you. Another thing, maybe Mr. Svandilis, along with staff, can check into the uh, compressed national gas compressed natural gas station that's here in the village of Wheeling at waste management. Mm -hmm. You're seeing more. I read an article recently that General Motors any day now is supposed to come out with a van that's like a dual system where it's gas and natural gas. We have a station here in town, and I notice other communities throughout the United States, waste management and other stations are open to the public. I mean, just to give an example. Something that's equivalent to a gallon of gas today at their pump is two dollars and forty-six cents, compared to five dollars or four sixty-three or four forty-three a gallon, or Speedway four thirty-five today. So I think this is something that be we should check into and allow waste management to open that up to the public, especially here in our community, because I think that's the trend that they're seeing in other parts of the country, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. So if you can get back to us on that, I think that'd be a great idea. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We have executive session for to discuss appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, discipline, performance, or dismissal of a specific employee or employees of the village pending probable ornament litigation and acquisition of real property. So moved. I would ask motion made by Trustee Jure, second by second. Trustee here. Roll call, please. Trustee Hine. Yep. Trustee here? Yes. Trustee Vogel? Yes. Trustee Argeris? Yes. Trustee Brady? Yes. President Abascado? Yes. The board will go into executive session at 8.30.